Hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Another wonderful evening with you. I'm really excited about today's topic because this topic I kind of channeled today and I wasn't sure what we could say about it, but mm. I think it's worth exploring and worth speaking about. And it's a little bit personal to me. I don't know how personal it is to you, but today the topic is suicide and what happens perhaps after one commits suicide and all that it entails. And I don't know how deep we're going to get. So how about we just get started? Wow. So question, Chris, has suicide touched your life in any way? No. <clears throat> no. Well, I, I have a story. It's a little bit long, but I think it's one to be appreciated. So I think it was last February. The, uh, February of this year of, tw of 2020 and um, I get a message from an old friend of mine in the Netherlands and he said I have something to tell you um, and he said that you know you're, you're gonna probably be shocked but um, our friend and I'm gonna call her Sally our friend Sally is no longer with us. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, what in the world? So let me set the scene, who Sally is in my life. So this friend, um, I'll call him, let's say, and he might be listening, actually. I, I'll call him, what can I call him? <laughs> Michael, let's call him Michael. Okay. <clears throat> I haven't asked him permission and I feel disrespectful of, of speaking about Sally without Sally's permission with her real name. So way back in the fall of 1999, I met a big group of exchange students at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And one of them was Michael and he's from the Netherlands and another was Sally from the Netherlands as well. Now, Michael and Sally didn't know each other when they first came. They became friends through nationality. And they would have, I remember they would have Sundays, I think it was Sundays where they were like, okay, we're not speaking any English. We're just going to have Dutch days. And they would do Dutch things, make Dutch food or whatever. But I was also close with both Michael and Sally. So I also spent a lot of time with both of them. Later, maybe the next year, I think it was next year, I went to Europe to visit Michael and Sally and a lot of other people. And I, I saw them again. We were all reunited. We had a good time. And that's the last time I saw Sally. But she's made a big impact on my life. Of course, I remember her very fondly. I have a lot of memories of her. And over the years, I'd lost contact with her. We became Facebook friends when she joined Facebook, but it was just like here and there. And Michael as well, Michael's sporadic con um, contact and, you know, keeping up with each other or whatever. So here, Michael was calling me saying she's not long with us. And he said that she took her own life. And so death by suicide. So I was very curious because I could tell that Michael was very shocked. He had just seen her the month before because it was her birthday. And Michael, uh, I, I could tell Michael was very upset. So I decided to try to contact Sally. And so I did. And long story short, she told me she tried to explain how it felt to be her and she used the metaphor she took me through this big forest and in this forest it was just all darkness and trees were everywhere and then the trees just got bigger but we kept searching for a way out and we couldn't find the way out and I could feel what she felt which was hopeless that was her big message she felt hopeless and in a dark place <clears throat> I'm not sure myself. I think Michael said that maybe perhaps she had been, she had experienced depression for a very long time. I, I, if, she, if I knew that way back then, I was not aware of that or I didn't remember at all. Second thing that she showed me was that 
when she decided to take her life, I, I, she showed me a puddle and she showed me a big rock. And when she swung the, she like slammed the big rock down into the puddle. But what she couldn't see was that the puddle, puddle was connected to kind of like a big lake or a river. And on, and this was like on the sunny side of the forest. So there were no trees at all. It was just all her loved ones that cared about her were all on the sides of the lake and the lake kind of overflowed from the ripple effect. And so everyone was washed over and I could tell that it changed the landscape of the lake itself for ever. So those are the two big things that I got. And so I spoke with Michael, who did not know that I was a psychic medium <laughs> um, after all these years. So he, he got freaked out because, first of all, um, the most significant thing was that he actually spoke at her funeral and he used the metaphor of a river that when a stone is moved in the river, the river travels differently forever. Uh, which was very similar to what I got. I also, by the way, uh, found out that this song that I was like, oh, I've got to tell him, I've got to tell Michael that I'm listening to the song. It was actually the song they played at her funeral. So I'm quite convinced I, I actually channeled Sally. So with all that said, first of all, I think it's a, a beautiful story, but also a very heartbreaking one. Sally was in her early 40s and she had two children. I'm not sure. I, I think she was married. I'm not sure of the details of what was involved there, but her two children were very, very young. So my question that I have about suicide, I've heard different things about it, but I believe that you have a soul contract. You contract what you're going to undergo before you get here, right? So did she contract to do this, to have this outcome for her children to endure the effects of this? Or did she like kind of tap out early thoughts, Chris, by the way, I don't know the answer. This is why I'm posing the question. It's not a quiz. This is a very serious topic. I'm not, I don't mean to like make it la light or anything. I, I don't think it's light at all. No, it's not. My experience and I could be wrong about all of this. So big asterisk. Yes. Is that suicide or death by suicide is never the possibility when you make the agreement. And that while I don't believe in a hell, a biblical hell, um, it's not as if if you commit suicide, like we had a kid that committed suicide when I was in high school, I didn't know him very well. It was like the one kid that did it. And we're like, oh, okay, he did it. Well, I mean, where's he going now? Right. It was, there wasn't, um, I'm, I'm sure that there are people that were sad and that the, the wash um, from the, the lake um, caught the family for sure. But it just didn't seem to surprise a lot of people either, if that makes sense. The, my experience when I've worked with people that are going through this is that suicide is never the possibility, meaning that the soul of your friend wouldn't say, I'm going to accept to be this person, I'm going to be Mary, and then I'm going to kill myself at the age of 43 and then let my kids and my husband sort through this on their own. My experience has been that that's the one thing that's like, oh, it's like system abort, right? Like that's like, it's not, there's no potentiality that's tied to that, right? That's not an outcome that you would actually choose because my 
understanding is that when we choose to come in as Christina King, we come in as Chris McCann, that we select these bodies, these circumstances, these possibilities and potentialities as a way of expressing our divine nature, right? And we're working things out. And that while suicide is a possibility, that's not one that you would say, this is how I'm going to exit. That's just not something I've run across. It's like, oh, well, I did this. Now, in just a couple of moments when I've done work with others where we've reached out to someone, there's like a tinge of regret, like, ah, I really wish I hadn't done that. But I did it, and there's no punishment for it other than, you know, you, you go back to start. And at some point, you're going to work on the same topics or the same problems again, different players, but on the same things. That, that's been really the extent of it for me is that one, you don't go to hell. That's how I was raised. Like you're not gonna burn in hell for committing or death by suicide. Um, and that two, you know, when we choose these learning opportunities coming into this expression where that might always be a possibility. Um, I don't think that we come in where we don't have the, the tool, the skill, the wherewithal subconsciously to be able to transcend that reality. Now I say that, and this implies that there's because there are there are chemical imbalances, right? And mental health is nothing to joke. I mean, it's just it's there. There are certainly chemical imbalances, and let's say someone doesn't have the wherewithal or the ability or the self awareness or anyone on the outside looking in that can say, "Hey, you need help," but then that person also has to be willing to receive help. Um, that. I don't think we sabotage ourselves coming into this lifetime. Does that answer the question? There's a whole lot here that we're going to unpack, I feel. But just... Yeah. I Yes. No, that completely answers the question. And, you know, I've heard that too. I Because it's kind of a little bit closer to me now, this is when I'm kind of trying to sort out what do I think about this? Because, you know, I knew her in life and I have experienced her in a, a different way, right? When I first spoke with her, she seemed, and this was right, I'm sure like maybe within two weeks of her passing, <clears throat> when I talked to her, maybe within a week actually, when I spoke with her, I could tell she had a lot of regret. I could tell in her face, her face had like this, like very um, sullen expression about it. Now I contacted her maybe sometime after that. I don't remember how much time, but she f seemed much lighter and she mm. seemed like she had maybe processed a lot of that. Um, that she had been feeling right mm -hmm. that's what confused me and that's what mm. I want to explore it's like you know what what went on there what why does she feel better now and I'm not saying she deserves to not feel better no she everyone deserves to be forgiven whatever needs to happen to feel good on earth on other areas in other areas that I'm all for it. Right. But it's a mystery to me. I've also heard what you exactly what you've spoken about. And that is you don't contract to do that. You don't contract to go out like that. And I've kind of accepted that, but I think that a lot of modern day religion has also seeped through, especially Christianity where it is, it is very unacceptable in Christianity to um, decide to uh, go out like that, right? How can I put it? I mean, 
decide death by suicide, right? Yeah. To take things yeah. into your own hand. Yeah. And into your own hands. So with that said, and I think that there that's a deterrent. Maybe that was a possible deterrent. Because I always think, why do religions do this? Or why do religions do that? And I think for that one, it's to deter people from doing that. On the mental health issue, oh my gosh, yes. And I'm currently getting my own mental health treatment. And I can very easily see how maybe you are even blinded to the fact that there's even anything going on. I can totally see that now. Yeah. You know, maybe you you don't even know that you're that you're feeling this way that's different than everybody else perhaps and that there are resources out there to help you. But even if you do understand that you have an issue, I think that it's something that's an ongoing maybe perhaps like depression is like that those are ongoing for the rest of your life it's something that you can't just go hey uh you know oh i'm i'm cured no you have to cope with it and you have to to figure out a way to deal with it so <clears throat> yeah i mean so i have to have that kind of uh, thought about it but on the other side what well, should i talk about that yet no i'm gonna go back to another example of some resilience of a spirit who did take his life and that is okay. I, I hope i'm pronouncing his name uh, it's eric medhus and if you look on youtube there's a there's a youtube channel called channeling eric and it's it was a youtube channel started by his mother Okay. And she has on a lot of guests in the metaphysic world that communicate with Eric and Eric brings spirits through. Yeah. Have you seen it? No, but when you mentioned his name, I um, got like the Atari symbol came through here. Oh. It was like you mentioned his name and the word had something. So I just felt like come through. So I was smiling because I was like, oh, that's a strong name. I, I've not heard of him before, but there's... Why, why did the Atari thing come through? Is that like, the sound of the name or, or is it yeah. an image from that kind no, of just the vibration just came down like, the, like, in and like sitting here right now. Okay. Very interesting yeah. because I kind of want to talk to Eric. <laughs> it seems like he, he gives a lot of information and he does a lot of good and he is very content with where he is now they've explored he's explored with his mother the decision and that evening that he made that choice and things like that so i don't want to speak for them if you're interested you can go find it but since then he brings a lot of people that we know through to communicate and to tell their message right so there's some resilience there there's some hope on the other side now I don't want that to be a reason or a justification or an excuse to do such a thing. So I, I, I do want to preface all of this and say, this is a very sensitive topic. And if you do have something to say, please say it. But also uh, what's the national suicide prevention hotline. I'm going to, I'm going to look it up while you're speaking. And, and I'm going to say that because I think it is important because we are speaking about it and I don't want to encourage anything. It is not the right choice and that's that. And there are resources, especially a phone number that you can call and uh, if you are thinking about such a thing. So I, I'm smiling um, because of context. And when you had asked on the front end, like Chris, do you have, have you been touched by this? Do you have any experience with it? And my immediate answer is no. I'm like, yes, you have, right? Oh. <laughs> Which is, which is funny because it, it'll help shape some of this conversation. Okay. Because I think there is conscious suicide, but then I think there's just wantonly living and... Oh, that's a big topic for me. That hits home. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Um, and then the second, which is why I think this um, makes sense, 
is around not just past life regression, but the space in between and the between lines work. So I'm over here smiling. I'm like, well, of course it all just kind of comes together because this is stuff that you and I are both passionate about. And it's at this point, it's much easier for me to smile and have these conversations because of the work that I've done on myself and, and with others and having more context around these experiences and how they're strung together. And like, I don't know if it's true or not. It could all be fantastical storytelling, right? And whatever tricks our mind plays on, on ourselves to make us feel better about what happens next and so be it. But um, I always feel better. And so does the other person or the persons that are attached to the work. So that'll be, we'll put a pin in that one. And we'll come back to it. Okay. The... <laughs> Okay, take off the jacket and get serious now. All right. Um, and at no point in my life prior to leaving high school, which I always thought was like the right time to consider suicide. Like if you're gonna look for a way out, you're gonna go before you're 18 or 19. By the time you hit 18 or 19, you gotta figure it out and you're good to go. For me, growing up in the 80s, I want to make sure I didn't disregard a, uh, a decade there. Mm -hmm. um, without the internet or really video games were nascent. We had books, we had the outside, we had sports, we had school, church, et cetera. And for me, suicide always just seemed like something that would happen like around seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th grade. Like those are really just gnarly, gnarly years for a lot of people. And seventh grade for me sucked. Eighth grade sucked. My ninth grade, my freshman year in high school is when things started to change. But I started playing American football and got more involved in athletics and expanded my friend group and, and everything was fine. But where the Yes You Did voice came in was post high school, in post college, but while I was married the first time. Now, when I was married for the first time, I was 20, 21, 22, 23 in there. And my relationship with alcohol um, really started to blossom or show up in a big way um, right when I turned 21. Then I remember my birthday, I went to the liquor store in Crete, Illinois, got a six pack of Guinness and it was on, right? Because I was, I was modeling, and that's my father-in-law. It's a big drinker. It was just kind of what what you did, and that became a way for me to begin to escape. Oh, where I, I was just not happy. Two wonderful boys that I love. My ex-wife is a wonderful human being. But at 22, I had already mortgaged out my life. I was working 65, 70 hours a, a, a week. And I was like, is that it? Like I've already done everything my parents have done. And how am I gonna spend the next 50 years? It's like, well, fuck it. And I was just drinking. So I hit a, so like, and I, you would know at this point in my life that drinking and driving, not a good thing, bad idea. Nothing good happens at one, two, three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I was out playing hockey with a bunch of buddies, stopped somewhere in like the Southwest suburbs of Chicago to get a hamburger. And I hadn't even been drinking that much. I was drunk, but compared to like seeing in triplicates or quadruplicates while I'm on the highway driving the 25 miles home, um, no, and I was okay. But I was listening to U2's Zeropa, or I was trying to, and I, was, I reached down into, as I'm on the highway, I reached down to the front to grab the CD off the, um, off the it fell off into the, the uh, passenger side floor. And then I looked up and there's a side of a semi that just wasn't there before. And then, bang. <gasps> <laughs> now it's probably two o'clock in the morning, something like that. Then I come to a hall, all I saw was like gray and I couldn't quite figure that out. And then everything just stopped. And this truck driver gets out and he's like, are you okay? 
I'm like, yep. And he drove off. <gasps> so I'm like standing in the middle of the highway and someone like other cars are going by. So then the, the state highway patrol comes and they put me in the back of the car and all that. Now I was probably 22, 23 at the time. <laughs> Do you think that stopped me? Of course not. And that didn't stop me. And then I just changed how I drank. So I get divorced and move into the city. And this went on for 10 plus years, right? And for me, alcohol is a way of escaping. And I didn't really care what happened. It was very much like in the moment. It was not the first DUI I had. I've had two of them. Um, and I didn't really care if I died. I didn't care if I lived. I, I just figured that if I was going to die, then all right, so be it. I'll just come back and try it all over again. Just hit reboot. That was a, an early proponent or an early adopter of, um, of that. And then there were other moments where it was deep and dark depression. I didn't know that that's what it was at the time, but like dark, could not leave my apartment, couldn't leave my condo. I just, I, I would get myself to a place where I could go pick up my kids and then drop them off and then just cry. I mean, it was like, it was really heavy and really sad. <laughs> it was not, not good. So I think there's the, there's, I don't want to call it impulsive, but there's the very um, making a decision and then taking a gun, swallowing pills, whatever. Or there's the more, almost way, right? Of uh, putting yourself in these positions where it's, you're, you're playing Russian roulette with not just yourself, but with other people. Like, what happened if I hit someone that had a family in that car, right? I mean, it's those things run through my mind to this day. And it didn't happen. So, you know, I'm not going to beat myself up over it. You see, you apply what you've learned. Well, thank goodness. Um, yeah. And that's, that's one instance. And there's been a couple of instances like that up until about 10 years ago. So, the perspective that I have now is like, wow, thank fucking God, nothing bad happened to anyone else or myself. And we're here now. I don't view that as having necessarily been um, like a sign from the heavens and that I'm here to do something magical. Um, I just attributed that to the possibilities that I gave myself. And I knew that if I got out of a couple of early sticky situations that I would have an opportunity. It just, it felt right to me to live a reasonably long, happy, healthy life in service. And that's where I am right now. So, but it was, that was, if I had this conversation with both of my boys um, about when in your life have you like committed or thought about committing suicide, like my older two boys, and as a parent, then when you hear these stories, it's like, oh my God, like I wasn't there. Like I didn't know, right? Which is something else. And, and one I think was more serious than the other, but both of my oldest two boys have had um, multiple friends, some because of their time in the military, some because of school that have taken their own lives. And that's affected them as well. So pausing there, and that's something that I'm not happy to share, but it's something I'm absolutely willing to talk about because that's part of, you know, how I, I am where I am right now is like, okay, <laughs> so how do we help people that don't necessarily have the means or the knowledge or the wherewithal? I mean, people had told me like doctors, like your fatty liver, like, you know, like how much are you drinking? I'm like, eh, like three drinks a night, but whatever. I mean, it didn't seem like a lot. And given my friend circle, like it didn't seem like a lot either, but it certainly led to some poor decision-making. And it really wasn't until we moved to California that I just stopped drinking a lot because other things were available. And then I started seeing this, you know, a, a psychotherapist and digging into it. It's like, oh, so I had ADHD, which in my form showed up as impulsivity and then as a way of trying to get these voices to stop, I would just drink myself into a stupor so I could get some state of sleep and peace, then rinse and repeat and just do the same thing over and over again for many, many, many years. Um, so 
how do I take what I've learned about that experience and then, you know, maybe just reach out to someone who maybe doesn't think that they have a problem. And it's like, well, there's just a different way of viewing this. And, you know, I don't, um, if you had told me, let's say 10 years ago, Christina, that's like, I would, I would have a glass of wine a week or every two weeks and be happy about it. And like, what happened to me? Because I just associated really? me wow. being fun and out and having a wide social network and, and dating and fucking and all those things. It was just really tied to a social life that was around alcohol. And that's clearly and ostensibly not where I spend my life now, but um, my relationship with it has changed. So like Meredith be like, you're, you're not an alcoholic. And it's like, oh, I, if I think that I am, I probably am. <laughs> right? So I'm really, 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 really careful about how and, and when I when I do that. Because I do love a good glass of wine. I like a glass of wine. So the, the reason, the why has shifted significantly. So there's that. Thank you for sharing that. That was very brave and very vulnerable of you. But I think that by sharing that, it really is helpful. I think that even just your experience alone is a step in the direction of helping others. So I want to express my gratitude for that. Thanks. And it was fun. I had a blast, right? <laughs> it's the most fun I ever had was around that. Um, but I don't feel like I gave anything up. I just transcended. Now I can. That, that brings up, yeah, definitely that touches on when you just don't care if you live or you die. And I think that kind, I mean, I don't, were, do you think that you actually wanted to end at any point though? No, I think if I really wanted it to, I would have put myself in a position where that, like, I mean, it would have overtly happened. Like another very much just in the moment and windows rolled down, steam three semis, music's great, smoking cigarettes and yeah, you know, I, I said like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe you don't, but that's just, that was my experience. Right, right. Perfect DM. Well, thank, thank goodness. And I, I think that brings awareness to depression, of course, but also living rec recklessly where you can alter your life as well as other people's lives. And then also one thing that popped in my head was also some people just escape uh, with death through suicide, you know, a, a very serious situation, maybe domestic abuse or th something like that. So, uh, you know, I, um, I'll be honest, I've never myself, I've never had moments of depression and I've never had moments where I thought of it. And I, in general, besides a couple of hiccups in my twenties and my thirties, I'm a pretty safe person as far as the choices I make with substances. Um, you know, uh, so I, I can't speak from experience with any of that. Uh, but what I do want to talk about a little bit is I just, I just lost my thought and it went to something different. Hold up. <laughs> 43. Um, it totally, oh, it's gone. Just a moment. Yeah, I know. So we've identified a few different mechanisms by which one can take their own life, right? There's the death by suicide. There's which is not um, self-sacrifice, right? Which is, and there's there are moments where people are called to do that. And that is a way that you can opt out. It is a possibility that you can choose. There's the, the numbingness where you're not truly living. And then so the question for me was, is it also a form of taking your own life when you don't allow yourself to truly live? And what does that mean, right? What does it mean to truly live? 
And I'm trying to think about what does it mean to truly live being messed up? And here's why. I think that everyone's a little bit messed up at least, you mm -hmm. know, life is hard and life alters you and you as a human are not perfect. And you start to, let's say shape shift according to the stimulation, whether it be struggle or trauma or whatever it is. And so I think that with that in mind, I lost my thought again. What is, I think spirit's trying to interfere here. Do you want to? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I mean, look at me. I'm just like, all of a sudden, just like so warped. I don't know what's going on. So hold on. Because I was uh, like, I knew exactly what I was going to say. I'm sorry. I got to check in. Something's oh, go going on. It, like, it's totally like overwhelming me where I'm losing everything. So. Oh, I got to set some boundaries. Hold up. I just had a surge of spirits come around. Totally my fault. I did not set the rules. I'm going to have to check out what that is, but I sent everyone away. <laughs> you know, what we could talk about is really, we could talk about past lives and the space in between. Mm -hmm. right. you know what I think it was I started to speak about suicide and because recently I've been open to spirits who are kind of in between earth mm -hmm. and the other side sorry to go off on a tangent here that I think that when I was speaking about it a lot of those spirits had something to say that's what has happened. And that's why I'm having a, a problem right now is because they were all kind of like bombarding me and interfering with my own thoughts. So I sent them away. <laughs> I okay. said one at a time and I'm going to talk to them later. Uh, but I do want to get back to my point because now I can remember it because now I've uh, sent them out and kind of set a boundary. <laughs> The adventure, I'm telling you. <laughs> so we were speaking about uh, people. Uh, let's get back on track. The numbness. And I. what did I say after that? I'm sorry. Um, numbness. Hiding. And there we sort of just ah, talked about the, uh, Yes, about... Um, I'm still feeling it. Jesus Christ. I'm having a hard time here. I'm sorry, Chris. I don't know what's going on. Should we just allow one of them to come through? There, I, I, I don't know. Let me, I mean, it's not my fault. I mean, I'm usually these go off. Let me get, grab a pen real quick and see what I can get. Let me just see. And maybe I just have to, Again. Okay, so I'm getting a lot of people stepping forward as a collective whole. Mm -hmm. They're kind of, I can't identify one person, but they really want to interject some of their thoughts because they're actually spirits of sorts, whether or not they've already crossed over or if they're in between. Mm -hmm. These are spirits who have already experience this and I have not so that's why they feel that they want to be heard as a collective whole Great. so with that said they want to confirm that we they do have to recontract and that collective are the people that have already crossed over okay I also have some spirits here that have not crossed over as well. So I've got like the full party going mm -hmm. on the, the spirits who have not crossed over, they want, they see this as an opportunity for me after 
we stop recording this to counsel with them and get them crossed over. Mm. And I think that's kind of the urgency that I'm feeling. And um, I think that both sides are speaking as the collective whole. And I think that the, um, the spirits that are in between that are stuck in between that are waiting for me to finish this and to kind of open up and, and speak with them. I think they don't have a lot of answers and I think they're very scared about it because they're also wondering about what we're wondering. It's like, what happens to the others that are touched through suicide? What happens on, uh, once they cross over, are they going to be punished? Are they going to feel guilty? Are they, you know, what, what effects did their choice have? Okay. I'm feeling better now. So this is exactly (laughs) where I should be. So the people who have crossed are saying, yes, um, you don't come in contracted as someone that's going to tap out early. Right. And so now I'm asking um, for the sake of conversation, I'm asking, well, then what happens to the souls who have already contracted with you, for example, children or mates like, uh, or partners or, uh, other relatives and family members, what happens to them since this is such an impact on them? So the first thing they say is trauma. Absolutely. So they're showing me kind of like a layer. It's kind of like a cake, right? Where there's another layer added on to their life journey. It wasn't planned per se, but I see it kind of meld into the themes of their own journeys. So they do have it become a part of their mission as well. Having to uh, deal with that kind of uh, trauma, that kind of struggle on top of and just kind of like layering on top of everything else there that they have uh, contracted to work. Does it make it, does it void their contract? Absolutely not. Does it make it harder? They don't want to use the word harder. They want to use the word challenge. It, it becomes a little more challenging, but they're showing me it kind of, um, it starts to a, a kind of a, adapt. I don't know how to explain it. Adapt the, the life journey. Like it, it, I think what, it's not something that alters their path per se, but it definitely alters the experience. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. I'm feeling much better now because I'm actually listening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just couldn't push them away and they have more to say. And so let me, let me keep the mic on them. Hold up. So they want us to be careful about not to speak about the reason so much. Because they say it's very important to understand the spiritual the spirituality behind it. The reason of what? Why people decide. Oh, sure. Yeah. They say they really want us to speak <laughs> on the spirituality of it. More so because that's uh, the reasons are a little bit more uh, earth and earthbound and scientific. But spirituality is what really... Uh, is our job to fill in the, uh, a lot of blanks as much as we can, yes. uh, you know, as, as people that we are. Uh, so they're going to, they're going to assist us with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they're saying chances are, if you're listening, if you've stumbled upon this particular topic, you have been touched in some way. Most everyone has, they said. 
in, in some way, even indirectly, even just reading news about it, mm-hmm. even just that one news article that just makes you just gets you right here. Right. And it just kind of stays with you. So it, it is, it is, it does touch you. So they do want to want us to speak about what they can do and they want your voice in this too, not just them and me. Right. So they're going to open the floor and they're going to, ask us to, I guess, brainstorm slash channel what people who have been affected by suicide can do, because for them, it's like they've already gone on, but here we have a chance to indirectly reach out to people who've been touched by it and also perhaps contemplating at some point. So Chris, uh, I'm opening it to you and you might need, I don't know how much time you need to sit on it or if you just have a response right away. It's separateness and a lack of connection. It's a lack of connection to yourself and the world around you. When, and I don't want to get so far out there with the, with the concepts. But when you begin to understand that as our embodied selves, from a physics perspective, we appear to be matter because of how the vibrations are recognized and come together. Human consciousness is pan consciousness or a cosmic consciousness. It's the quantum field, it's the Akashic records, it's the zero one point. There's all sorts of names for this, whether it's scientific or in terms of religion. But we're closer and closer to being able to identify that consciousness doesn't come from my brain. It doesn't come from Christina King. It doesn't come from Meredith or Hudson or Kingston or the trees that are all back. And that even consciousness is um, almost too woo-woo of a term. It's an awareness. And that we all are connected to each other from plants, animal, each other and ourselves. So for all of these moments where we don't feel connected, what can we do? Can we sit and pray when we don't believe in a God? Can we like expect for someone to show us kindness when that hasn't been our experience? Is there going to be an immediate bolt that comes in and strikes common sense or what others would call common sense into you and, and cure um, any sort of mental illness and we see people, you know, talking to themselves. I mean, for all we know, the people that are talking to themselves in Santa Monica are far closer to being right headed than you or I are. The connection. It's understanding that when we touch a flower and that flower might recoil or embrace us, or when we see um, a hawk flying through the sky, when we're able to grab a tree, when we're able to look at someone, they may have a mask on, but we can make eye contact now and learn how to communicate with each other and ourselves in these very innate ways. Um, It's how a chimpanzee would squeeze your finger as a way of communicating and letting you know that things are okay, right? And these are universal languages love languages that we've established as part of the animal kingdom. We're not separate from apes, chimpanzees, dolphin, octopus, dogs. We happen to be riding on this rock um, because of this big bang, which spewed out a bunch of, um, you know, chemicals. And out of all those 
chemicals uh, in the reaction, then we all came from that. So we all, as Moby said, we all are made of stars. When I have moments where I feel absolutely disconnected from myself, which has ironically largely been the case this week, and it just, I mean, it just catches up with you. Um, I will look for and seek out ways to connect. Of course, outwardly, but the challenge put in front of us now that we're all going into lockdown, right, and going into this longer winter is connecting with our self. And connecting with ourself can be some of the scariest work that we're going to undertake because it forces us to be honest about ourselves to ourselves and then to other people. That for me was the scariest undertaking out of any of this me pulling myself out of my own morass. If someone had to tell me the truth and I wasn't listening even when people were, so it had to be me. And how I got there was understanding that life just simply wasn't working for me. Right? It was not just affecting me, it was affecting people around me. And, um, and it's like that sort of a radical shift. People suffer. There's a large chunk of what happens here on this earth. And suffering happens when we fail to understand our place and our role in all of it. And we suffer because we create anxiety. And anxiety is trying to be two places at once, right? I'll wake up in the middle of the night, like, why the fuck am I working on this, right? This makes no sense. But when I do have anxiety, it's because I'm just not being present. And when I'm not being present or my mind, my monkey brain is running in 20 different directions and I get just that feeling right here, I just force myself to breathe and connect. And the one or two things that we all have in common is this. And one, we can breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, all right? So just imagine that I'm taking in some of this awareness and then exhaling that's is which isn't serving me and take a sip of water and feel the tip of water go from my mouth into my body and then feel that the being human is the divine experience when our when we pass again the asterisk and i could be wrong about all of this when we pass and our bodies, the, the vessels that we've chosen are, are not going to serve us in that sense, the energy or the soul still has somewhere to go. This is all just vibrational energy. And it connects back, in my experience and the conversations that I've had, to this collective cosmic consciousness. I want to do a better job next time of not using some of these esoteric terms, but it reconnects back to that space and our bodies are no longer here is when we lighten up. How much more of a miracle is it that out of the tens of billions of solar systems or galaxies, even in this solar system that exists, let alone the planets, that on this one little one, that our little stream of consciousness decided to land right here and take on the body of Christina King. Why would you have selected to be Christina King? Why did you choose your parents? Why did you choose your physical appearance? Why did you choose to go to South Korea knowing that you've had an opportunity to select out of all the other sentient beings, Christina King? That is more of a miracle to me and more of a divine experience than just transcending the body and, and going back into the ether and going back to class. So the question I would have for you, Christina, is how do you 
then determine for yourself that you are worth celebrating that I, Christina King, am worth celebrating. And that I, of course, being more of the collective. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. How can you determine if you're worth celebrating? I don't know if I know the answer to that for myself. I like to celebrate myself, but what are the reasons? I think that is some exploration that I'm going to do for myself for sure. Because I, I, I do have to think about that. That's, that's a very big, profound question. Hmm. Well, what you just said was absolutely profound and perfect and i can't mm. say much more than that that's for sure and i want to thank you for that mm. the only thing i have to offer just to add a little bit to that because i you know what when i go through this and edit i'm actually going to listen to that again and just enjoy it mm. i think that's that's exactly what i need to hear even, even just being me and not having any, you know, any kind of suicidal thoughts or anything like that, I just feel like that's something that everyone needs to hear. It's uplifting, it's inspirational, and it really makes you go inward. And that's, that's the whole point that, you know, of the whole thing that you said. And the only thing I have to offer is feeling whole again feeling whole again, or if you've never felt whole, if you don't feel whole, I think that you can ask yourself, what's the, what's the first thing that you need to start feeling whole? It, it, that's, that's kind of broad, I know, but there's something that you can do to start feeling whole. And if you don't know, then reach out to somebody that maybe could put it into a little bit more of a perspective if you're not coming from a place where you're kind of seeing it clearly or seeing um, any way out of where you are. I feel like people deserve to feel whole. And I can't say that I always feel whole. I'm also, as I said before, I'm, I'm getting my own mental help uh, my mental health help at the moment as well. So uh, one thing that I'm doing is becoming whole again. Uh, Chris, the whole. What, um, what I realized this week is my missing link, right, is being of service. Say that again. Being of service. Being of service. Helping people. Like that's how, that's when I really feel like I'm coming to life. When I'm truly living is when I'm making eye contact with someone and I can see a spark or see gratitude. Um, and that connection to me, whether it's with a, a bat that we found in the pool who somehow could not get out of the pool, just knowing that we helped the bat just get out of that. Um, this woman at Costco today who um, like was apologetic because she cut me off in line, right? And I'm just smiling underneath my mask and you can tell a lot just by connecting with people, running up and down hills, right? And making sure that people have what they need when, I'm, when we're doing special work and, and helping people remember who they are. That's challenging right now because we can't go volunteer. We can't go spend time in homeless shelters if we wanted to. We can't necessarily go serve Thanksgiving dinner for people because those aren't being made available to us now that we've pulled the emergency break on the lockdown. So the best way for me to connect with myself is to connect with something or someone else and be of service. And I, I want to say that last week I kind of had a big week of exploration. 
inside of myself. And one of the things that came forth that I, it completely blindsided me. I had no idea. I've not been living who I truly am mm. all this time. It's been 41 years. And I actually saw who I was for the first time. And I was like, oh, and I was just absolutely shocked. And I realized the plot that I'm following and the real plot are kind of two different things. And I'm torn between both plots and things are starting to look a little up because I'm going in the right direction, or at least I, I have the awareness that I need to be going in that direction. <laughs> I don't, I don't know so much of uh, if it started or whatever, but one day I will feel whole. I've seen you whole and awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Just smack me on the ass and set me up the ladder. <laughs> How did you know? Okay, so what he's talking about, can I can I say? Of course. Okay, what he's talking about is that um, I did a past life regression with Chris and in it, <laughs> I smacked his ass and set him up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story, but he's referring to the past life regression because that's what I feel like it's my jam. Just saying one of them. Yes. yes. And I, were. I felt whole and that's all I did all weekend, by the way, was yeah. practice on my, on people around me. You were one of them. And the reason why is because number one, it feels so damn good to do it. And number two, I want to be the best because that is my service to others. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hibbity bobbity boo. Yeah. My <laughs> gosh. Ah, you just coached me, Chris. Is that what just happened? That's what just happened. Thanks. You totally just coached me. Yeah. Look at me. I'm like, oh, yeah. That is. I'm so glad you said that because after I had the wild weekend of journeys with a lot of people and I have another week coming up of them or weekend, let's say that, you know, after that, I was feeling exactly what you just said. I was feeling whole. Mm -hmm. I really was. So yeah, coming soon. <laughs> that's, that's going to be uh, a lot of what I do. It's funny. I'm thinking of the outfits that you were wearing and like they kind of depended. I mean, at certain points you were a white owl at certain points you had like a, a tunic on. Um, but the version of you like slapping me on the ass was like you in overalls a very light sleeve, like, like a t-shirt. So like kind of sleeveless mm -hmm. and um, like just light and vibrant and yeah. So that's how, that's how we know. So what he's talking about my outfits, we were not together in human life. We were on the other side and I was going, I was accompanying him as a guide and kind of coaching him through going through past lives, which he really didn't need because he was kind of off like a rocket and all I did was chase him around. So, <laughs> but apparently I had different outfits on Yes, <laughs> and I was a white owl, which I talked to my, another friend who I did a regression on uh, last Saturday night. I talked to her about you seeing me as a white owl and she was like, Oh my gosh, that's huge. I was like, why? It, I didn't even know that I was the white owl. You know, I, I can't see myself. I'm just trying to do my thing. And she was like, no, she was like, that's a deep, deep ass animal in like mm -hmm. um, shamanism and things. It's like wisdom. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, great. Well, yeah. And I told you, I mean, we have an owl that lives over here, right? Yeah. And I've seen it and it stares at me and it's all, it's all good. But when Hudson and I were walking around the neighborhood, Earlier that night, we heard it. It's like, like it was, the wingspan was so huge, it almost like blotted out the moon. And wow, I'm like, what's the white owl? And then knowing that we were coming into that work later, so 
it's not the first time that it had really impressive birds and or raptors like flying a couple of feet above the head when we're doing this type of work. Um, it was like, cool. And then it showed up again when we were going in. It was like, yeah, it's amazing. Like it's like there's, it's, it's all connected. Right. I mean. That must really mean, hmm. mean something to you, birds and raptors and things like that. I hear jellyfish too, but I'm not going to go touch one. No, no yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> or the tops. No, it depends on the kind. Right. It was cool. I mean, I just, the, the level of connection and co-conspiracy with the world and universe around it is well worth diving into. So I'm glad that uh, this is resonating. Yeah, definitely. Well, right, do you have yeah. anything else that you'd like to say or share before we end this? Um, I love you and I am really excited Ditto. for your journey. Thank you. And likewise, really. Uh, and I do want to apologize for the, the spirit induced brain farts in the middle. <laughs> At least you had the wherewithal to hit mute. That's it. <laughs> or did I? I was just kind of like paralyzed there for a little bit. So thank you. Thanks. See you soon.